right, well, let's start this conversation with this. In your book, you talk about the importance of knowing the difference between social justice and social service. Can you explain why that difference is important and why doing just charity work isn't enough? Um, it's interesting, I had that discussion in the book when I interviewed Michael Eric Dyson, and um, he kind of criticized a lot of the, the, the athletes as being complacent with um, doing charity work and not so much speaking on different things. And this is my always, my, always my answer to this. Because um, people always ask, do I think it's a requirement that athletes speak out? And I always say no. I wouldn't say it's a requirement. Like how could you, you know, expect somebody to do something that they're not passionate about? I would say that as an athlete, you have a tremendous opportunity to use your voice and use your platform and, you know what I mean, do that. But if it's not what your passion is, then you shouldn't speak out. You know, because a lot of time, what the first thing they're going to do if you're an athlete and you speak out is they're going to test you to see if you know what you're talking about. And if you don't really know what you're talking about, then you shouldn't be the one speaking out because they're going to make you look like a buffoon and that can kind of hurt things even more. Um, and they're quick to be able to, to point to an athlete that, and, you know, and, and kind of show that he doesn't know what he's talking about, so he shouldn't be speaking on this topic. So I would say that if it's not your passion, then, then don't speak out, to be honest with you. Okay, for whatever reason, many people don't see the impact that the events that are going on in our country and our communities have on athletes. Mm -hmm. In your book, you and those you interview talk about your very personal connections to these events and these victims. Mm -hmm. So talk to us about the human element of sports that's often overlooked when we have this shut up and play discussion? Well, a lot of times people think that athletes are kind of in this protective bubble. Like the things that go on in society don't really affect us. And the one, what I wanted to do with the book is really show the stories of these athletes and why they actually chose to speak out on different things. Um, not that they just wanted to interject themselves in a conversation of the day, but why it really meant a lot to them. So for instance, I, I interviewed Dwayne Wade. Uh, everybody knows Dwayne Wade from the Miami Heat. And I asked him why he chose to, spoke out, to speak out after Trayvon Martin was killed. And he said, because you know, he's looking at the pictures of Trayvon Martin and he hears a conversation of the hoodies and everything like that and he thinks about his sons. And he said, you know, if you put a, a, a hoodie on his son, you know, he looks just like Trayvon Martin. So then he had to have the talk with his son. And, and that's the same thing that I experienced, but hearing um, an athlete make that personal connection to something just kind of changes a lot for mainstream America. I mean, it just, it just pay attention a little bit more because Dwayne Wade is talking about it or LeBron James is talking about it or something like that. And of course, you're gonna have the segment that doesn't wanna hear it at all. But a certain segment who, who you know, look up to Dwayne Wade and look up to Carmelo Anthony and Russell Westbrook and all these different athletes right now, um, and their, their sons like have their jerseys, you know what I mean? So if something really affects them like that, they're gonna just pay more attention to it. Okay. You became an activist as a high school student. Mm -hmm. And in your book, you tell the story of a very horrible incident you had with police on your way to a basketball game. Mm -hmm. And you made it to the basketball game, but you didn't talk about it with your teammates or coach that night. Right. But later you talked to a teacher and told him that story and you were on the speech and debate team in high school, yeah. and he said, you need to write a speech about it. And you did, and you won numerous awards. You guys won a state championship in speech and debate as well as basketball. Mm -hmm. So tell our audience about that event and how that shaped your life as an activist. Oh, okay, wow, you did your homework there. Huh? I did. <laughs> Goodness, you need to go back. So, so what happened was, you know, I'm on my way to a game. Um, you know, I'm like 16 years old, I'm driving to my game. And there's a big rival that we had. And so I'm hyped for the game and everything like that. So I get stopped by the police. So the policeman doesn't come out. You know, another police car comes up. Nobody comes out. And another one comes up. So there's three cars, flashing lights and everything. So they, they come out. And, um, you know, they have me sit out on the ground. And they're searching my car and everything like that. And I hear them talking. And they're like, you know, you know I've seen him before. You know, they, I've just, I remember just hearing them say, like, I've seen him before. His face looks familiar. Let's keep searching. You know, you sure you ran his plates and everything? There's something's gonna come up. So, you know, they had me on the, on the ground. Um, you know, I, and I remember the cars going by because I was in this busy section. And you know, when, when you see flashing lights and you know, you're going past the police station, everybody kind of stops and looks and sees what's going on. And I remember all the people looking at me and just being embarrassed, you know? And so I'm there for like 45 minutes. And I remember the, um, I, I remember this just like it was yesterday. 
Um, I remember the, um, one of the policemen said, uh, can you open your trunk? And I said, well, don't you need a, a warrant for that or something? And like the way they all immediately turned and looked at me, like I knew that I, you know, need to just tell, do what they told, do what they said, you know, just follow instructions. And so I said, okay, yeah, yeah, go ahead. You know, and they opened my trunk and that's when they held up my Booker T. Washington, it was my high school Booker T. Washington, and they high, held up my gym bag. They said, oh, he plays for Booker T. That's where we know him from. And then, so they all like closed, closed it, got in their calls and they all left. And one of them, you know, patted me on the shoulder. It was like, you know, stay out of trouble. And I was like, that's it? You know what I mean? Stay out of trouble? That's all you're going to say after all of this? All you're going to say to me is stay out of trouble? So I went to the game. I was like 45 minutes late. I barely got there in time. And I was just pissed. Like, I was just upset. And, um, you know, played a real aggressive game. Just like, was elbowing everybody, you know, dunking hard. And just, just everybody was like, man, what's wrong with him? So the next day, I'm in speech and debate class. You know, I remember I didn't sleep that whole night. Like, the whole, I, I saw every hour of the clock, and I didn't even want to go to school. I didn't tell nobody anything, nothing like that. So the next, the next day in speech and debate class, I'm just kind of venting, just sitting there just talking. And, you know, I remember this little girl, Brandy, she's just sitting there listening to me like this, you know, and I'm just telling her all this stuff that happened, and I'm mad and everything like that. So my, my speech teacher, Mr. Blang, pulled me back to the side in, in his office, and he said, hey, you know, I'm, I'm hearing everything that you're saying, he was like, you should write a speech about that. I was like, a speech? I was like, man, I ain't thinking about writing no speech. You know what I mean? I'm sitting here pissed. And he was like, no. He's like, other people need to hear that this happened to you. And this would be the perfect outlet for your original oratory. Original oratory is when you, you know, make your own speech and, and speech and debate. And so I did it and, um, you know, started performing it around Tulsa and I started winning a lot and the newspapers wrote about it and people started, you know, coming up to me and saying like, you know, thanks for telling that story, because that happens all the time, but don't nobody listen to us. Mm -hmm. I started hearing that more and more. So then I was like, okay, the only reason why they're listening to me is because I play basketball. That's it, because this happens all the time. So that's when I kind of said, okay, there's something to this, this using your platform. And I just kind of kept doing it. And you continued that through college. You spoke mm -hmm. out at Syracuse as yeah, well. Yeah, spoke out at Syracuse, you know, spoke out with the, when I was playing professional. I mean, I just kind of kept doing it, kept using my platform. Mm -hmm. But the athletes that I grew up admiring were those athletes that used their platform, mm -hmm. you know, so I was kind of walking into it. So I grew up reading about Bill Russell and, you know, Kareem and Muhammad Ali and, you know, John Carlos and Tommy Smith, though, all those athletes. So, yeah, that's just what I can continue doing. Okay, well, while we're on the topic of athletes and their platforms, let's talk about Colin Kaepernick. Mm -hmm. Do you think that when he first sat, first took a knee, he thought that this could jeopardize my career? And do you think this was the appropriate way to protest, or mm -hmm. should he have done something different? Well, it's, that's always an interesting question. I don't think he thought that he was going to get blackballed from the NFL and never play again. But um, when people say it was at the appropriate time, or was it the, you know, can you protest on your own time? Like, you hear that a lot. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's like, well, the whole point of protesting is to make people uncomfortable and, like, bring it to them when you have their attention. If you protest on your own time, ain't nobody gonna see it. Right. You know what I mean, what, like in your living room? Yeah. Like where nobody's gonna see you in your living room. You have to protest when everybody can see you. Mm -hmm. And you know, the interesting part of just how hard people fought to make his message about the opposite of what he said it was about. Mm -hmm. Like it's not like it was, you had to you know, do any deep digging or try to figure out what his, he said why he was protesting. He said, I'm protesting because of police brutality, uh, systemic racism in the political system. And then he said, it's not because of the military and veterans. He said, I have family who are military. I have respect for the military. It's specifically because of what's going on with police brutality. Like he said it. So, I mean, sometimes people are dedicated to misinterpreting your message because he, he was clear about what he was protesting for. Right. But, you know, I mean, that's, that's one of the things. He's, he's going to be somebody who you know, I interviewed Layla Ali for the book. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that she said was that the way people look at Muhammad Ali now is not the way they treated him back in the 60s. She, when people, she was talking about mainstream America. Mm -hmm. She said, now they build museums and statues and all this stuff. But she was like, but back in the 60s, he was like public enemy number one. I mean, he said he wasn't going to the army. You know, he was hanging with Malcolm X. He's talking about racism. You know what I mean? He was like literally public enemy number one. So, 
you know, what she said, always says is like decades later, decades down the road, you're gonna hear people speak about Kaepernick in a, in a different way. They're gonna have like a more respect for him and you know, that, they, that he took all this courage. And then you're gonna kind of think like, wait a minute, I remember when everybody kind of hated him. You know, and that's, and that's how they feel, like if you talk to people from the 60s, how they feel when they, feel, when they hear mainstream America praising Muhammad Ali now. So the narrative has switched from what Kaepernick said mm -hmm. the protests were about to Kaepernick is anti-American, anti-military, anti-veteran, anti-flag, et cetera. Mm -hmm. What can Kaepernick and those who joined him in the protests do to switch the narrative back? Well, that's the thing, they did it. Like I interviewed Eric Reed, and Eric Reed was one of the people who were um, kneeling with him the entire time. And he said it repeatedly. I've seen like 10 clips where he keeps saying, look, I'm gonna keep on saying it. It's not about the military, it's not about the veterans, it's about police brutality. He's like, it's not anti-police, but it's police brutality. You know, he's saying all that over and over again. So, I mean, after a certain point, it's like, you know, somebody's just dedicated to misrepresenting you. Mm -hmm. But he, they, he's saying it. Right. So, you know, but I, I respect the fact that they continue doing the work that they're doing. And that's one of the things that was really interesting in doing this, doing this book, you know, I didn't know some of the stuff, some of the stuff that wasn't really reported. And, you know, that's why I wanted to do the book. But so like, for instance, y'all tell me if y'all heard this before. So after Kaepernick took the knee, the um, 49ers, you know, they got together and all the players said, okay, well, every single time we go to an away game, we're gonna go and meet with the police department in that city of the away game. And we're gonna have a community forum, bring people from the community, bring young people, and have everybody be able to hear each other and listen to each other. We're gonna use our influence to try to change some of the laws and some of the rules that they have, because each police department in every city is different. And we're gonna try to use our influence to do that. And they did it in every city. Did y'all ever hear that reported? Right, so I'm, I'm interviewing Tory Smith about it, and he's telling me this, I'm like, wait a minute. I ain't never heard this, why, why was this reported? He was like, I don't know, but that's what we did in every single city, you know, and, and some of the cities, they instituted body cams, some of them, they, they, you know, they started to see some of the people in the community, so they didn't see them as like just targets, but actually people, when I'm talking about like the young people and things of that nature, and they was listening to, I was like, that's great, that should have been reported, but you know, I don't know for whatever reason it wasn't. So if you were an active professional player today, mm -hmm. would you take a knee or would you protest in a different way? Well, it depends if I'm, a, if I'm in the NFL or the NBA. You're in the NBA. Okay, well the NBA, you, you have the freedom. It's, 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 the NBA is a little bit different than the NFL. You know, the NFL, like what Kaepernick felt, and this is the thing, everybody has their own way of protesting, uh, of, of, of activism, and it doesn't look the same. So I interviewed some people from the Players Coalition. Y'all know, know who the Players Coalition is? So there's a group of NFL players that goes to Washington and lobbies for different laws to be changed. Um, Malcolm Jenkins, um, Anquan Bolden, there's all people and they make up the, the Players Coalition. And they do tremendous work. I think it's like absolutely great. Um, but their activism doesn't look like Kaepernick and Eric Reed's activism, but it's still activism. You know what I mean? So there's a lot of different ways that you can do it. But in the NBA, there's just a different overall acceptance of, act, of activism, whereas in the NFL, it's kind of resistance to it all. So it's like whenever you, you speak out or whenever you say anything or do anything in the NFL, at least the way it appears to be, you know, is that they're, they're not really as welcoming to act, activism. That's the only way, I could, only way I could say it. Well, let's talk about that a little bit more because the NFL has always been the more Republican and conservative of mm -hmm. the professional leagues, mm -hmm. both in its ownership and in its fans. Plus, the NFL uses nationalism and militarism in its pregame ceremonies and in its marketing. So do you think that that conservatism, nationalism, and militarism has had an impact on how the public view the players' protests? Well, okay, well, first of all, the NFL with the, with the nationalism and militarism, that wasn't always the case. Right. They didn't always do that, but they got a, they got a deal, they struck a deal with the Department of Defense, mm -hmm. um, and the, part, the Department of Defense basically pays the NFL to, be, to do all the nationalism and the militarism and stuff like that. So that was like just part of, it's just a business deal. So that's kind of, that's the only reason why they're really pushing it the way that they are. Right. Uh, other than that, they, I, don't, I don't really think they would really care, but the NFL cares about money. So when something is affecting their bottom line, then they want to squash it immediately. Kind of like, so, so like, you know, domestic violence. Do you really think the NFL really cares about domestic violence or just the perception 
of domestic violence if it affects their bottom line. So when, when Ray Rice happened a while ago, if y'all remember the video that came out with Ray Rice, um, they had known about it for months and didn't do anything. And then you look at the long list of different things that, that they, you know, they knew about different cases of domestic violence and did absolutely nothing. But then the video came out and then it made the NFL look bad. And then sponsors started saying, okay, we might pull out. Then it's like, okay, no. The NFL is completely against domestic violence. And they started doing these commercials and all this stuff and they banned Ray Rice forever. I'm like, but look at all these different, so it's just, it's kinda, kinda hypocritical, right. you know, to be honest with you. But when you know that that's what's going on, um, you know, it, it makes, but a lot of people still don't, don't necessarily know that that's how the NFL kind of thinks. And, you know, it, it's, so, so, so for instance, I'll give another example. So um, Nike, okay, so Nike endorsed Colin Kaepernick, right? So do you think it's because Nike really agreed with his cause or, and they really had a, a, a soft spot in their heart for what was going on in society and everything that Colin Kaepernick was raising? Or do you think that they saw a, a demographic that was a little bit more their target demographic, the ones that were gonna be waiting for the new LeBrons to come out and wearing the Nike hoodies and wearing, a, so I don't think that their, their demographic was the make America great again crowd. You know what I mean? It was the younger generation who wears all the Nike clothes and stuff like that and who are, you know, kind of going with Kaepernick. So they said, okay, we're going to go with that. Mm -hmm. That's how I interpret it as happening. Okay. Well, you and know, it's interesting it's, because Kaepernick was about to be cut mm -hmm. by Nike when someone in the communication department said, you know, that's just not going to be good PR right now right, if we cut him. Yeah. And so that caused them to relook yeah. at the relationship and then they realized that, well, wait a minute, we can use use this but in I, our favor. If, but if, if they had a different demographic as their target mm -hmm. market, I think then, I don't think they would have, they would have touched them. Absolutely. We well, spoke a little bit about the NBA and mm -hmm. how it's a little more open to activism and, and player protests. Let's talk about the WNBA mm -hmm. because the WNBA has been a little bit more successful, mm -hmm. if you will, in its, in its protest mm -hmm. and activism. Why do you think that is? Um, I don't know. So in the book, I interviewed Swing Cash and Tamika Catchings. If y'all know who Swing Cash and Tamika Catchings are, they're WNBA players who were who were monumental when they had their um, when they made their statement. So I don't know. Let me just catch y'all up on what happened. So Philando Castile and Alton Sterling were back-to-back -back murders in the summer. Um, like the one day Philando Castile was killed, and the next day uh, Alton Sterling was killed. It's like back-to-back, -back. and so they were playing in the summer. So what happened, Philando Castile was in Minnesota, and the Minnesota Lynx, they wore these shirts that said, um, said like, you know, Black Lives Matter, you know, Philando Castile, or something like that. Um, and so there's a strong reaction from the league. And they said, okay, nobody do that again, or you're gonna be fined. And that was the memo they put out to all the WNBA, right? And then after they did that, it was like amazing. Like the whole WNBA like stood with the Minnesota Lynx and they all did it together. Like every single team, you know what I mean? And they all ever, then they, then they had what they called a media blackout. So after the game, they answered like two qu quick questions about the game. Then the only thing they would talk about was what was going on and how they could use their influence to, you know, affect change in society and, and hold police accountable and all, all this stuff and they all did it together. Like I had never even seen anything like that before. So I asked Swing Cash, I was like, well, how did y'all do that? Like, how did y'all get everybody to be on one accord and do that together? Because, you know, you have, you know, a lot of WNBA players are like from overseas. Like they're not even from here. They don't even know what's going on. And she was like, well, first women do it differently. And then she was like, well, you know, some of our teammates saw their sister hurting about something and they said, you know, if you're hurting, I'm hurting, and we're gonna stand with you. And she's like, and that was really it. And I was just kind of surprised because, you know, at that point when I had interviewed her about it, Kaepernick was kind of by himself. You know what I mean? It wasn't really one of a lot of people who were supporting him. And, you know, I just thought what they did was incredible. And, that's, and the thing about it is when everybody did it, they had to reverse their decision about finding everybody and suspending everybody because they can't suspend everybody. They would have nobody to play. You know, so I, I thought that was amazing. I don't think it got enough coverage. So that's why I wanted to really cover it um, in my book. And I've done different things at, at WNBA games with Swing Cash and different, you know, players. 
And I think it's just amazing what they did because they don't make the money that the, that the NBA players make. So when they get fined, like it hurts them more. Yes. You know, and what they did was, you know, they just said they can't find everybody and they can't suspend everybody. And they all did it together. I thought that was amazing. So on the line of women do it differently, mm -hmm. I read The Heritage. And that's a great book if you haven't looked at it. Um, but Howard Bryant tells a story in the book mm -hmm. about Billie Jean King when mm -hmm. she's trying to rally other female tennis players to join the Women's Tennis Association. Mm -hmm. And as she's rallying the players, one of them says, but if we do this, we could lose everything. And Billie Jean King speaks up and she says, wait a minute, we have nothing. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing to lose. And that's how she persuaded them to band together. Mm -hmm. So it's been said that the next wave of social justice in sports will come from women. So do you think that's true? And why is it so important for women to speak out? Um, well, I think when you look at, at all social justice movements, when you look at the back of the planning and everything like that, the, the, it's always, you know, pushed by women. That's just, just how it's been, you know, and, and I think that this is going to follow definitely suit, but, but also is pushed by young people, you know what I mean, really like the youth. Mm -hmm. And that's how it was with the civil rights days, you know, when um, SNCC was doing all the stuff and they were, you know, you know, having the different battles with the older generation who wanted to do it one way and the younger people wanted to do it the other way. And Dr. King was like, okay, I'm going with the younger people. They're the, you know, they're the, the future. And it's always interesting because now, you know, people always say, you know, that they were supportive of Dr. King and support, but when you look at the, the stories, they really weren't supportive of Dr. King at that time. Uh, but he really focused on the youth. And that's what I see now happening with a lot of the, the activism that's going on. You know, the younger, and like the younger generation, y'all are just different. Like they're, they're, you, had, you had the 60s and you had the times of like, you know, Muhammad Ali and John Carlos and everybody. And then you had a little bit of a lull for a while. Like wasn't nobody really speaking up like that in the, in the 80s and the 90s. It was kind of quiet. I um, mean, you had like Mahmoud Abdul-Roof and Craig Hodges, like a few here and there, but now, like, it's like everybody, they're, they're, just, they're just using their voices. And you see high schools and, you know, completely standing together and taking a stance on different things. It's not always just one topic. Uh, I think that's beautiful to see. And now y'all got social media. So social media changes everything, like everything. I mean, y'all don't have to wait for a reporter, you know what I mean, to interpret your story the right way. You know, y'all could just say whatever y'all want to on your social media platform, and then the reporters come to you. I mean, so when I, when I was in D.C. And I, and I wanted to speak out against the war in Iraq, right, um, I went to the Washington Post, went to the Washington Times, the people who we saw every single day at practice, and they were like, oh, no, we can't touch that story. And I was like, really? I was like, y'all literally follow us around trying to get us to talk to y'all about anything. <laughs> And y'all don't want to touch this? And they were like, nah, we can't touch that at all. Uh-uh. And you know, now with social media, y'all can say what y'all want to say. That's power. Very powerful. Uh -uh. So you talked about playing for the Washington Wizards, and mm -hmm. you still live in the DC area. Mm -hmm. Washington has a professional football team there mm -hmm. with a very offensive team name mm -hmm. that the owner refuses to change. Right. Yet in other leagues, they're doing away with these derogatory mascots. Cleveland's doing away with Chief Wahoo with its baseball team. What's it going to take for Washington's football team to change its name? Everything is about money. So if you see sponsors threaten to pull out, not even pull out, but just threaten to pull out, you'll see the name change just like that. But no sponsors have done that. That's what it boils down to. The money is what moves the needle. So before uh, with the NBA, if y'all remember, um, the Donald Sterling from the Clippers, that tape came out with him saying all the different stuff, and the sponsors started pulling out. Then you saw things change just like that. That's what, that's what, that's what, you know, everything else, I mean, it's not like they don't know that it's offensive, or they don't know the history of the name, or they, I mean, they could look stuff up just like everybody else could look stuff up, but until sponsors pull out, nothing will happen. Speaking of money, let's mm -hmm. move on to the NCAA. Okay. Because the NCAA and Division I athletics have a lot of issues, mm -hmm. and folks around Louisville will tell you that. We, we know around here about NCAA and issues. And the most notable issue is probably pay for play. Mm -hmm. So a lot of writers, including Taylor Branch and Ben Strauss and mm -hmm. Joe Nocera, have 
likened the NCAA Division I football and basketball to the plantation and to indentured servants. Mm -hmm. Do you think players should be paid? And are players not speaking up enough about that issue that affects them? Well, I think something's gonna change soon, um, regardless. You know, I think there's different players, different leagues that are popping up, and it's kind of kind of forced the NCAA's hand. Um, you know, I, I think it decades ago, before they had the big contracts and they were making as much money as they are, you know, you could say, okay, it's a good trade-off. But now, I mean, the amount of money that they're making, it's a billion dollar industry. And it's a billion dollar industry where you don't have to pay none of the, none of the workers. You know, it's just, it's, it's the perfect system business-wise um, if, if you're at the top of that business. And, you know, you hear a lot of the excuses as to why they can't play players. And you know, you know, like, where's the money going to come from, or what about the non-generating um, sports, or you know, can we play all the sports, or you know, what about different divisions? And my my answer to that always is, is, you know, you have no problem paying the coaches. No coaches are working for free, no matter what sport or no matter what division or anything. And none of the people that are there working are working for free. Everybody, from the camera guy to the, to the, everybody is being paid except for the players. So they could do it if they want to, they just don't want to. Mm -hmm. Tell the story that you shared with my class earlier mm -hmm. today about when you were snooping around Coach Beheim's no. office. <laughs> so my freshman year, I was at Syracuse, and me and my point guard, Jason Hart, uh, were just up in the office, you know, just looking through stuff, probably snoop snooping around stuff we ain't supposed to be looking at. And um, we, we saw the numbers, and we saw the numbers of what they made the year before, because Syracuse played against Kentucky in the, um, in the championship game. And we was like, wow, that's how much they made just from March Madness? And then we started looking at the, what they made from merchandising, and then what they made from the TV deal. I was like, wow, this is a lot of, like we, I guess I just didn't know that they were making as much money and then we saw Coach Beheim's salary. Then we saw the TV deal salary. We saw all this different breakdown. I mean, and when you look at all that, you just see, I mean, just economically. I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's big business. And, you know, they have enough to be able to come up with systems, you know, where they could actually pay players. But they don't want to. Okay. That's all it is. So let's talk about harnessing the power of the player. Mm -hmm. And... You've said that college athletes have a lot of power, whether they realize it or not. Mm -hmm. I think we saw that demonstrated with the University of Missouri football team right. when they banded together and said, we're not going to practice or play games unless the university president is fired. Within 48 hours, the president was gone. Mm -hmm. So it showed they had tremendous power. What can college athletes do to harness that power and to use it? to fight some of these issues? Well, the thing about it is on, on, on colleges, they try to make you think as athletes that you don't have any power. And you know, they'll hold something, y'all yeah, don't have to answer, but I'm, I'm sure that all of you have heard um, something along the lines that you have to kind of not embarrass the university, or you can't, you can't and, you know, make the university <laughs> look bad, as if all of the, let's say the entire basketball team banded together to speak out against whatever topic it is, that, that that would make the university look bad. I think it would do just the opposite. Um, but the fact is, is that when somebody disagrees with you is when they want you to shut up. They want you to shut up and dribble, stick to your sport. And I think the thing with, with college athletes, they have to understand that there's strength in numbers. So like when, when what happened at OU, um, the OU football team, you know, the whole football team banded together and said when, the, I don't know if you remember, it was a couple years ago, one of the fraternities had this like racist song that came out and it went viral and everything like that. And oh, you weren't gonna do anything about it. They just weren't. And then the football team all banded together and they, they said, this is wrong, we don't want this on our campus. And it was like, just like that, you know, there was movement. And then they ended up, you know, identifying the guy. They couldn't find any tapes about it before, but then when the football team said that, then they magically found the tapes of it and identified the guy as, and, you know, they expelled players and, you know, banned the fraternity for, you know, whatever they did, but they took some kind of action. Mm -hmm. But that's just the power that, that athletes have. I mean, we were just on Morehouse campus, and there was a lot that was going on there with, the, with, um, with violence against women. Um, they were having their... their um, homecoming and they're doing things with Spellman and that was like the talk 
around campus was all these things that were going on. And, you know, all the, the, the students was like, well, you know, we want to get, bring more awareness to this, but we don't know how. So the whole basketball team was in there when we were talking. I was like, well, why don't y'all connect with the basketball team? And if y'all say something, everybody's going to listen. I was like, I guarantee you that's what's going to happen. If y'all say something and take a stand together against this, everybody will listen. And you know what I mean? They, they listened to us, and we got the notice a while ago that they, that they did, and everybody listened. And now it's a whole different, I mean, it's just, athletes carry a lot of weight. And you can use it in a lot of different ways. You can use it for good, or you can use it for bad. And, but just realizing the power that you have, it's just, you know. And it's not just athletes, though. And that's one of the things, like, I, I interviewed Kareem um, Abdul-Jabbar, and the first thing he said when I said, what do you think about all these athletes using their voices? He was like, that's great, but I want people to use their voice. You know what I mean? I want, I want young people to use their voice. I want people to use their voice in numbers and together and things of that nature, and he always stresses that. And that's the thing, you know, right now, especially with the social media age, you know, you have power. Well, in talking about people using power, I'm a white woman. Mm -hmm. I'm not an athlete. Mm -hmm. I'm never going to be mistaken to be an athlete. Mm -hmm. So no, no worries there. But I want to be an advocate for mm -hmm. social justice. So what can I do? What can the folks out here do to be an advocate? No, oh, there's so much you could do as being an ally. Um, and there, but there's so much work being done now. What I always tell, like I, I speak at a, different, a lot of different organizations. So like an organization will bring me in to speak on a panel or talk and they always present that. And you know, what, what I always say is as, as this group, a lot of times, and I, I know it's still like that in, in college, a lot of organizations sometimes stick to their groups. You know what I mean? So this group is, is a, about this. This group is, you know, whatever, whatever the group is, is titled. And sometimes working together with other groups and, you know what I mean, seeing um, like goals and helping each other. That's what I would really say. I mean, in colleges, there's strength in numbers. That's just what it is. So you have five groups together that are all banding together and supporting one topic. Right now, there's, the faculty has to listen. That, that's all there is to it. And, you know, it's, it's, easy, it's, it's easy to be an ally. Um, you know, but, but the thing about it is a lot of times people don't have the empathy to even desire to be an ally because they're stuck in, you know, a lot of times we have these conversations. They're like, well, well, what are athletes complaining about? You know, you're making all this money. Why, why are you even complaining? You know, or, all right, these, these police um, beatings and killings, they, they can't be as bad as what you're saying it is. There has to be something else. And that's where people, you know, don't, realize the, the humanness, like with the first question that you asked, of athletes. So showing them these stories shows a different level of, of humanness. Because a lot of times people don't look at athletes as human. You know, you look at them, you know, when people say, okay, um, I just want to enjoy my, my uh, game and uh, I don't want to think about all that other stuff. Just want to enjoy my football. I don't want to think about no activism, no police brutality, no nothing. And it's like, yeah, but you have the luxury of doing that. Like, you got to understand that a lot of athletes, as soon as they leave the game, you know, there's still a black man on the road driving a nice car and the police stop them, you know? And when you get stopped, like I always hear, like Bill O'Reilly says, well, when I get stopped, I just listen to the police officer and I have no problems. And I'm like, man, that ain't the same thing that happens when I get stopped. Like, I, I'll tell you a story. I, just a little while ago, and I, I wrote about it in the book, but it happened again a, a while ago. Um, you know, I coach my son's AAU team. So I, I, sometimes as, as an AAU coach, you end up driving some guys home. That's just what happens. So we're driving home and one of the, um, I get stopped by the police. And so immediately, you know, what I do, I, you know, roll down the windows, turn the music off, turn the interior light on, put my wallet here, put my, take my registration, put it here, put my phone on record right here. And then I just sit there with my hands at 10 and 2. So I'm doing it, and you know, my guys are like looking like, well, what, what are you doing? And I'm like, just, just relax. So the police come, um, you know, license registration. And I'm like, okay, um, my license is on the dashboard. Um, I'm, can I go and reach for it and give it to you? And he said, yes. And he shined his flashlight on my hand, and I reached slowly to go get it, and then slowly to, to go give it to him. And then, you know, doing all this different stuff. And it, it, you know, it turned out I had like a tail light that was out, and that was the only reason why he stopped me. But, you know, I'm talking to to all the different players, and my son is like pissed. He's like, "Man, he's treating you like a criminal, and you ain't even do nothing." I'm like, "Dog, it doesn't matter if I did anything or not. 
you know, the way that he perceives this situation could be the difference in us getting home safely and us not getting home safely, you know? And, and that's just the reality of being a black man in America and being stopped by the police. Now, th that's a situation that hearing athletes talk about that, um, it just presents it in a different light for a lot of people who didn't think that athletes had to deal with any of that stuff. And that's just reality. I mean, I remember having the talk with my son when he was like six, seven years old. I mean, my, my, my wife is six feet, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm six nine, oops, sorry. And so my son is tall for his age. So he's six or seven years old, but he could easily be mistaken for like 11 years old, right? So I had to have the talk with him about, you know, if you're in a store, you have to remember to always get a receipt so nobody can accuse you of stealing. You know, if you can stop by the police, you know, don't make any sudden movements. Keep your hands where they can see you because any sudden movements will make them automatically pull out their gun. That's just what happens. So those aren't lessons that white people have to tell their kids. It's just not. So like my son now is 13 and he said, okay, in a little while, you know, I'll be ready to drive. And so I'm all automatically thinking, oh my gosh, well, I gotta teach him more things so he can survive when he's stopped by the police. Immediately, that's where my mind goes to. You know, I mean, it's just not the same for mainstream America. That's not the first thing that you think of. So, uh, you know, we was on a panel and, the, and the, the guy was talking about when he got stopped by the police, he's like, oh, and I have to get this ticket. I was like, man, ain't nobody worried about getting a ticket. That is not what black people think about when they get stopped when they get, getting a ticket. It's about getting out of that situation, you know what I mean, without anything bad happening. And anything bad happening can have a whole lot of different, different, different ways that things bad could go wrong when you're stopped by the police. So, so that's, the, that's the, 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 the stories that a lot of people that I interviewed are telling and why they're choosing to speak out when they see something happen. Um, and just hearing it just, just resonates differently. Okay. Well, I have one final question and then mm -hmm. we will turn it over to the audience for, for questions. But every fall, I teach a sports and society class. Okay. You visited the class today. Mm -hmm. And from the very beginning when Kaepernick took the knee, we have talked about the protests in class, pretty much every single class over the course of the time. And I've had student athletes in my classroom mm -hmm. who've said, if we took a knee, our coach would kick us off the team. And so we can't protest. Mm -hmm. So what do you say to those athletes? And more important, what do you say to those coaches? Well, and, that, and that's the tough part. And that's what we were talking about today is that, you know, when the person who is the boss is, has a certain opinion, um, that's where it becomes a little tricky when you do speak out. But they can't suspend everybody. You know what I mean? They can't suspend the whole team. They, if two people do it, three people do it, they can get rid of you. You know, if you're not the star of the team, then yeah, you could be expendable. But they can't suspend everybody. So like the WNBA, they wanted, they said, if anybody does this, you will be fined and you will be suspended. And then everybody did it. And they can't, they would have nobody to play. Right. So, you know, that's just the power that you have. But, I mean, the, the, in, in college, you're at, you're, at a, you're at a time where you do have to be careful, you know? And, and when I had a situation in college, my, my coach was really Jim Beheim, for I know Jim Beheim. You know, I, I was part of this big demonstration in Syracuse because they wanted to have, like, the pepper sprays. That was, like, the topic. They wanted to give the security guards pepper spray. And, you know, the, the, the protest was because they were only using the pepper spray on the black and Latino parties. You know, somebody starts getting an argument, they pepper spray everybody. You know what I mean? They just weren't seeing that happen at the white fraternities. They just, they, they didn't treat it the same. So this is my freshman year. So I was like, oh yeah, that's not right. I'll join y'all. So I'm sitting there and I go with them and I'm at the protest and of course I'm, you know, six, nine, you know, 240, 250 pounds, and I stick out. So the paper, the, the, the front of the Syracuse, the orange, was the, the Daily Orange was a picture, and you saw me right there in the middle of the protest. So um, Coach Beheim called me in his office, and he said, you know, I, I see you are pretty politically active there. Um, he said, well, you know, what I will tell you is, if you're going to stand up and say something, be prepared to defend it. And I'm never gonna be somebody that tells you you know, not to speak about something because that's just not who I am. Um, but make sure that you can defend your position. And that's what he told me. And so from that, I had a certain level of 
I, didn't, I wasn't going to have the resistance to everything. That just wasn't my experience. And, um, you know, but if I did have that experience, that resistance like I had in high school, um, when you're the, when you move up and you have a different position, you have more power. So, you know, the top players on the team have a little bit more power to be able to do different things. So I would say to a player, if they want to speak out some, with, of some, on something, they're going to have to connect with some of the top players on the team and get them on their side. You know what I'm saying? Because the top players on the team have more say-so. And then doing it together, they can't, they can't get rid of everybody. Okay. All right. Well, I believe Mr. Fogel has the microphone, so... Yes, I do. And over. now it's audience participation time. As you know, if you take classes in the School of Communication, we love student participation. We as instructors don't like to carry the load. We like for you to do that. So this is your opportunity to ask some questions, maybe some things. If you can come to me or raise your hand, I'll come and find you. And I see a hand already. I already had a question, but I'll start with the students and we'll go from there. Okay, so this is a multi-part question, I guess. Um, going back. Would you please identify yourself? Hi, my name is Tyler. Uh, going back to your story with police and having to have those discussions with your son, why do you think people of color are still facing these issues today, even with so many people speaking out? And do you think it will ever change? If so, how? Um, I think that it will change when um, more police that do break the laws or they, you know, fire their guns when there was no actual threat are actually held accountable for it. Um, I think that's when you'll see things change. You know, when, if there's no accountability, there's no reason to change. You know what I mean? If right now you have a license to kill, which is basically, you know, what it appears that there is, um, and there's no repercussions, then things don't change. You can't really, it's, it's hard to change people's hearts or change how, if they're gonna be afraid of you or look at you, it, it, it's difficult. You know what I mean? But if you make it illegal for them to be able to do certain things, then, then, then you'll see a change. All right. Who's next? While I'm looking, um, I was, okay, do I see a hand over here? Okay. Um, I was going to ask you, in the book, when you finished it, was there anything that you looked at it afterward, just like a student doing a paper or a project, and go, boy, I really messed that up. I wish I had done that differently. Anything in it you would have changed? Well, you know, I, I was trying to be, one of the things that I did was I interviewed a uh, family of the victims of police brutality. So I interviewed like Trayvon Martin's brother and Eric Garner's daughter, uh, Terrence Crutcher's sister, you know, Flanda Castile's sister, you know, that nature. And it was, it was those are the toughest interviews that I've ever had to do in my life. Um, Cause they were really emotional. Like I'm doing the middle of the interview and um, Liza Castile like breaks down, you know what I mean? And I, I, I feel bad because I was like, you know, she was like, no, I'm like, if you don't want to do it, it's okay. She's like, no, 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 I, I, I want to do it. And so some of the times I'm, I'm asking them questions and I ask a certain question and it triggers like tears well, welling up in them. I'm like, oh man, maybe I should have asked them that. You know what I mean? And you know, they, they reassured them. I was like, no, it's okay. But it was, it was, those are tough interviews to do. Um, but they all thanked me afterwards. And the thing that what they, what they do is they connected why it was so, so important when athletes do use their voices, because you hear it straight from their mouths, why they appreciate it so much, why it means so much to them. And um, you know, one thing, like Trayvon Martin's brother, Javaris, told me, which really kind of shocked me, he said, you know, if it weren't for athletes, um, you know, many people wouldn't know my brother's name. And I was like, well, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, when Trayvon Martin was first killed, um, you know, they were trying to get the local media to cover the story, and they didn't want to cover the story. And, you know, they just said, well, there's just another young black man that got killed. This isn't really newsworthy. And I was like, wow, that's what they told you? And he's like, yeah. He's like, but then LeBron James wore the hoodie, and the whole Miami Heat team wore the hoodie, and then Dwayne Wade's talking about it, and you have Carmelo and all these different athletes talking about it, and then people who are fans of the athletes you know, looked and said, well, what is this that has LeBron James all riled up? And, you know, Dwayne Wade looking all emotional on screen talking about this. And then they started paying attention to the story. And, and I was just, I was just kind of shocked by that. I mean, I was still kind of shocked. I didn't know that they struggled to get even coverage from the story. 
But you know, really being sensitive about, about the topic, and you know, nobody wants to make anybody emotional or make somebody cry or anything like that. So looking back, some of the questions I was asking, I was like, all right, maybe I should have asked that a little bit lighter or something like that. So those, you know, that's just, you know, you're, you're, you're usually your, 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 your own toughest critic. No, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay, let me walk over here. Again, please identify yourself so everybody else knows who you are. I'm uh, Aaron Gokris. Um My question is, being like a kind of a sports social justice uh, activist, um, I know like Kaepernick and all of them, they face issues. Did you face any issues just trying to stand up for uh, social justice rights? Or, or like, did you um, face any like backlash from like mm -hmm. fans or anything? I, I did. Um, so when I was with the Washington Wizards, uh, Michael Jordan was on the team. So every day, Michael Jordan would get these big boxes of fan mail, right? And, um, you know, I'd probably have like two or three letters, usually people from Syracuse or something like that. So after I spoke out against the war in Iraq, I remember it. The, the, next, the next week, um, they brought in the mail, and I, and I had a big old box. And I was like, whoa, that's for me? And I was like, yeah. And I was like, all right. So I started looking through them. And while some people were very complimentary, other people were really, like, really, really mad. You know what I mean? To where you shouldn't be in America. You know what I mean? Like, you, like making threats over, over letters. See, we didn't have social media. You know what I mean? So there was no Twitter mentions that they could do. Right now, they just do that in the Twitter mentions. But I just got a big box of, of letters, and that was kind of, you know, that was my first time really getting like hate mail. I didn't really, you know, sometimes you get people that, you know, say, you know, we don't like how you play or you suck or something like that. It's usually just somebody from another team, Georgetown fans or something like that, right? But not just really just targeting like, you know, like I hate you type of a thing. And that's like a, that's like a deep thing to read sometimes. So, but I never got like, you know, any kind of backlash from management or anything like that. So in the book, I, I, I interviewed, I interviewed, you know, Adam Silver, I interviewed the, you know, um, Ted Leonsis, who was the CEO of the Wizards, and Mark Cuban. And, you know, those are the people who, that, uh, that I played for, that I, that I knew, and I wanted to get their take on activism. And that's where it was completely different. You know, they're all complimentary of it. You know, the NBA is just, it's different. I didn't have an experience of, of people telling me in, in management positions that I would be, um, you know, kind of punished if I did speak out. I just didn't ever experience that. All right, I saw a couple of hands back here. Okay, in the very back. I'm getting my workout in today, but that's okay. Feel like a game show host, like The Price is Right or something going around talking to the... Hi, I'm Natalie. Um, I'm an academic advisor and I work with student athletes. And I was wondering if you had any suggestions on how to, I guess, like either give space to student athletes to protest or to, you know, be activists or, um, you know, because I feel like it's better when it comes from students and it's very organic. But like one time I, I gave them like study hour, like study hall credit if they would write postcards or letters to their senators and I got like one kid that did it and I was like, dang. So if you had any like ideas or suggestions about that. Well, I was just in a, I was on a uh, panel with a program called Rise and we were talking to a lot of people from different professional teams and they were asking that same exact thing. And the, what, what they said was, well, when they have the, the, the kind of support from the top, it's a little bit easier for them to create a safe space. Now, a lot of people who, like, and if you said that, you, that they had issues here where a coach would say, if you do protest, you are off the team. Well, you know, an academic advisor can say all the, anything they want to. They, they know what the coach said. So they're not gonna think that that's a, it's a safe space for them to be able to voice their opinion or something like that. So it would be a little bit more difficult. Um, you know, I, I think that there's, it would have to be something where the, it comes from the players when you're in that type of, because you, I mean, I won't say you're part of the system, but y you know what I mean? Y you are. So it, it, I would say for you, you would encourage players to be able to do that kind of on their own 
and it would be a source of, you know, doing it together, kind of, you know, against the resistance that might not want them to do it. So that's a whole different kind of a conversation. You know what I mean? Uh. All right, uh, two up front. Let's take a couple of more, and then we'll wrap it up so we don't keep you guys here all night, because we know everybody wants to get started studying for finals, right? Get a jump on that, right? Okay, I'm well aware. Okay, here we go. Hi, I'm Layla. So I have a really important question. Do you think that it would be more effective to change the whole police system or just the laws around like law enforcement authority? Because we find that when they implemented body cameras or even car cameras, dash cameras, they'd lift the hoods of their cars or try to obscure them so that they couldn't record whatever was done. And still, officers that were being monitored still performed acts of hate against people that they had pulled over on the sides of the road. Well, there has to be accountability to come with the, with the, with the uh, body cameras. So when you have somebody that an incident happened and you actually see it on camera, there has to be some level of, if, if you do this, this will happen to you. And if there's not that, then nothing else really matters. And that's, that's the problem now. Each police department um, conducts itself differently. So, so the police department is not like federally ran. You know what I mean? Each one is completely different. So that, and that's why what the 49ers were doing was tackling each one individually and, and have, because they each present their own set of problems. So like say for instance, one of the things with the NYPD, um, they have a real strong union. So a lot of times you would have a policeman who, who say shot somebody, right? They wouldn't call the ambulance, they would call their union rep. And sit, that's what happened to Akai Gurley, if you don't, if you just look up the case of Kyle, Akai Gurley. And um, you know, the police shot him, you know, he was in the wrong, he was in the stairwell, and he got kind of nervous, he was a rookie cop and shot him, and then he's out there bleeding out, but he calls his, his um, union rep first because of their union. Now, so then you have to work on this thing that the Players Coalition does, work on changing the laws to where if you do something like that, you immediately will have certain pro uh, repercussions as a police officer. That's the only thing that, that will change it, is, is repercussions. If you don't hold somebody accountable, then they have the, a license to do whatever they want to do. And I think that's, that's, that's part of the problem. Do you think there should be a screening procedure for police officers of when they're going there in the force? Of course there should be a screening procedure. You I know, but like, there's still some officers that still continuously do that. Even after they get caught, they get put in jail, they come back out and they do it again. So those are like repeat offenders. So, mm -hmm. so just like that. You should have the same type of system for police officers that you have for regular people if they commit a crime, okay? So if you have repeat offenders, that your, 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 your punishment gets harsher. You know what I mean? Whatever the, whatever the number of years, whatever the everything is, fine, whatever. And another thing that, that's been raised a lot, especially by the Players Coalition, is that when you see fines, um, police payouts, that it doesn't come from the city and the taxpayers' dollars, but it actually comes from the policeman's pension or something like that, right? Nobody has instituted that. But if you instituted some of those things, those are direct um, repercussions that the police department would feel, and then you would see a deterrence of some of the, some of the and, and just, to, just to reiterate, you know, it's not an anti-police thing. You know what I mean? The police are important in society. You have to have the police. But everybody should be, even police officers, should be against police who abuse their power. You know, that's a totally different thing. And that's one of the things that's, that's tough is that, you know, there's this blue wall of silence. And, you know, you think that the wall of silence is bad in the NFL. I mean, in the police departments, they don't, they don't speak about each other, even if they're in the wrong. And so I was, I was speaking at actually a police convention. And, um, you know, because they wanted to see kind of what, and, you, and it's funny because looking at the crowd, you could see the ones who were feeling it and the ones who were not. You know what I mean? You could just tell. And it was like, you know, some of them want to work with you and they, and they talk about having community policing being, you know what community policing is, is when the policemen actually live in the community. And that works, it's, that's been proven to work like great. You know, their, their, their kids go to school in a community and they go to the church there and they, you know, they're part of the actual community instead of being like a, you know, you're like you're on an enemy land, you know, just coming in and you have targets. So that's, that's the big difference. But those are all things that you have to push to change the law. But first, you have to get everybody's attention to let them know that there even is an issue or there even is a problem. And that's what I feel that Kaepernick was doing. You know what I mean? Letting everybody know, okay, this, this is not right, what is going on, and something needs to happen about it. And that's, you know, each, everybody has a position to play.
Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good question. All right, so the next time we host one of these events, uh, Stacy, this young lady's going to co-host with you. Okay. <laughs> she's going to ask. She's going to ask questions. Yes, we've got one more, then we'll wrap it up for tonight. Hi, my name is Donald. Um, I had a question about if you were still a student athlete and had a social issue that you wanted to speak out against, but had to face a coach with negative views on what you were speaking against mm -hmm. and were threatened with the possibility of losing your scholarship. Um, what would your take on that be? Because many student athletes can only go to college if with that scholarship. So. Oh, that, I think that's a great question. And, and, you know, like I said, I didn't experience that when I was in college. My coach was kind of more, a little bit more supportive of it. And like I said, if, if there was something, it would have to be, you, you have to really walk a, a, a very careful line. If you have a coach that specifically told you, okay, he is against this. And, you know, if you do it, you will be off the team. And sometimes it's hard to get everybody to support you. It's just, it's just the reality of it. And if it's something that you feel strongly enough about, um, you know, getting everybody else to, to take a stand on something, whatever that something is, whatever that topic is, um, you have some convincing to do. And I, but I wouldn't suggest going about it alone. I would not. Because you have to understand the position that you're in. So you're in a position of when you're when you're a college athlete, you're kind of you're, you're an employee at will. You know they could they could take your scholarship for different reasons, and they could just cite any. You know, a lot of people don't know that. You know what I mean? That when you when you have a scholarship, they could they can also take your scholarship and make up anything. Um, I've seen it happen. You know, so you you have some convincing to do with people to stand with you. I wouldn't if you was in a situation like that with with a coach. I, I wouldn't advise you to stand alone. Now, once you're a professional, it's different. You know what I mean? You have a little bit more flexibility to be able to stand alone. Um, but it's always good to kind of survey the situation and have a plan. And I would say, you know, getting your teammates to support you and that you all take this stand together is completely different than one person here or two people here taking a stand. It's just different. 